As my 30s came to a close, my health problems ramped up from headaches to asthma as if to underline all that I was learning. Working in high-stakes TV production, I filled the toilet bowl daily with blood, my bowels screaming in outrage. Then came radio and the chronic lung infections. No new diet, no amount of vacations or massage or meditation could restore my equilibrium. The first inkling of of my come to Jesus moment came while I was seated at my desk in Toronto, months before my 40th birthday in late 2015, perusing photos of the Sunshine Coast Trail on my old Vancouver newspaper's website. A friend from the student press, now the author of popular hiking books, had trekked the route, snapping pics along the way. There was a moody blue tinge photo taken at sunrise from the summit of Tin Hat, a shot of Fiddlehead landing hut, located in dense forest, laundry hung out on a line, an image taken from behind Tin Hat, the valley below ensconced in thick fog. I read my friend's piece about the North Coast Trial on Vancouver Island next, pinning for the next rainy beaches, humpback whales, and the fern-dotted forest ravines I saw in his images. Sitting there at my computer, I felt such an intense, visceral longing for the forest. It was akin to being desperately thirsty and urgently in need of a glass of water. Outside the newsroom window was the smog, the packed subways, the sirens and the constructions, the street people experiencing psychotic breaks, the stress, the aggression, the suffering, the unraveling of society. But in these photos, there was green, quiet, calm, adventure, a different kind of life. Two months later, I moved home to Vancouver. Shortly after arriving in early 2016, I left the newsroom for good, walking away from screens and off into the woods. That's an excerpt from Tara Henley's Lean Out book, a meditation on the madness of modern life. I briefly mentioned this book in the previous episode. My friend Father Allen lent me this book, What Tara goes through in this book, in this sort of memoir, is how much disconnection she felt while working at this high pace job in TV. What Tara Henley realizes in this book is that our modern life, filled with anxiety, is mainly to do with our disconnection with our community. And to be very specific, in the fact that we actually don't have community when we move to urban places, when we move to cities, because we've left our community by moving away, right? The whole modern project is to find freedom away from family, away from tradition, away from our villages. But after having experimented this last century, we're starting to realize how damaging it is to us as individuals. It seems that human beings are social creatures who need social connections and very strong social connection and this is precisely what henley realizes when she's in toronto working as a current affairs journalist she's experiencing the glamour the glitz the brushing shoulders with celebrities and politicians but she's coming home to her one bedroom apartment by herself eating takeout spending time binge watching tvs not really doing anything and living for tomorrow, living for the adrenaline rush that she'll get on the Monday morning, or sometimes even dreading it. But what this all ends up leading to is she starts experiencing health issues, especially chest pains, and she goes to the doctor, and she goes through a bunch of cardiac workups. Her tests come back normal. What becomes clear is that she's actually suffering from anxiety. And what becomes even clearer is that if she wants to heal her body, she has to leave her work. She has to stop participating in this rat race that we're all caught up in. At first she thought maybe the problem was something that she could solve by living alone by herself in the middle of the woods. But soon she finds out that the thing that she's actually missing, the thing that's causing all of this is her lack of of connection, her lack of deep connection specifically. She ends up taking a few years off, and in this time, she gets in touch with 
a journalist named Johan Hari, who is the author of Lost Connections, Uncovering the Real Cause of Depression. And in her conversation with Hari, she finds out that depression and anxiety in our modern world are caused by a lack of connection. And that our modern world, our urban cities, actually do not meet the basic psychological needs that villages and families have historically served us. And interestingly enough, she finds people who are trying to create communes around a shared mission. But the funny thing is, these communes, they always start off well, but eventually everybody ends up leaving. And reason for it, supposedly, is because communes, unless they are religiously based, never last for a long time. And I thought that was quite an interesting point because, again, religion does what families and traditions do, except on a much higher and a deeper level, right? Because you now have a shared, not only a shared history, but a shared tradition and a shared system of belief that embeds the individuals and grounds them. Another person that she meets is this guy named Charles Montgomery, who is the author of Happy City and the founder of a consultancy firm, called Happy City. And his whole goal is to find a solution to this epidemic that we have of loneliness. So this is an excerpt from uh, her meeting with Montgomery. There are many causes of stress in our lives, he added, he meaning Montgomery. But the single greatest cause of stress is social isolation. It's absolutely brutal. It pumps stress hormones into our system every single day. And then he goes on to say, and yet we've been designing cities that deepen social isolation for marginalized people, of course, but also for the rich. Henley mentions this Colombian politician named Enrique Penalosa Londono. What Enrique Penalosa ends up doing during his time as mayor is shape his city to be much more focused on building community and building connections. And so this is a quote from the mayor inside of lean out. What are our needs for happiness? We need to walk just as birds need to fly. We need to be around people. We need beauty. We need contact with nature. And most of all, we need to not be excluded. We need to feel some sort of equality. So throughout this, Henley realizes that what she had in Toronto and what she had in Vancouver as a journalist was everything that she had dreamed of as a little girl, having the glamour, having the glitz, the status, But she was missing the most fundamental thing that a human being needs to live a fulfilling, purposeful, meaningful life. And that was connection, deep, deep connection. And the other person she ends up meeting during her time is none other than Sebastian Junger. Sebastian Junger is the author of Tribe. He's also a journalist, but he's a war journalist. And what Junger in Tribe finds out is that human beings are tribal, social animals. And during wartime, during conflicts, what ends up happening is people are drawn back to a more, quote-unquote, ancient way of relating to one another. And when it comes to soldiers, because that's where he has his most experience, he ends up finding that soldiers feel most connected during wartime, right? They live together, they sleep together, they eat together, they're side by side, they're fighting together. And all the distinctions that separate us, you and me, Right, the race, the class, the status, that it all falls away when you're in the middle of war, when you're fighting it, or when you're, when you're hiding from bombs. And Junger in Tribe mentions how psychologists, psychoanalysts during World War II couldn't understand why people were either leaving psychiatric wards and the fact that psychiatric wards fell in numbers during these times. And Junger's point is, What war does, it it brings out the best in us. It brings out the part of us where we are willing to sacrifice for the group, for the common good, for others. And this sense of sacrificing, this outpouring is emotionally satisfying, it's gratifying. And this is how we have always lived as human beings. But now when we move to urban places, we've lost this completely. And the only people, according to Junger, who experience this on some level are soldiers or tribes that are still living in this way. Within Junger's own life, he tells Henley that when he came back from war, 
he felt like he had lost something and he was trying to figure it out. And the thing that he realized he had lost was his sense of connection, the sense of deep community. And that was what he was grieving and that's what he wanted to create. And very near the end of the book, Henley writes, if we are honest about it, if we look at the actual numbers, overwork is essentially taking all of our precious life energy. All the hours we could be spending with family, laughing with friends, learning new hobbies, getting out into nature, exercising our bodies, eating home-cooked meals, sleeping, participating in our communities, and creating real social change and converting all of that time and energy and attention into profit. Profit, in fact, for a very small group of people. This analysis, a bummer if ever there was one, explains so much of what has happened in my own life. And it certainly explains why I was so angry at the lean-in phenomenon that I wrote an entire book in opposition to it. Henley's book, Lean Out, is a good reminder for us not to end up like her and not to realize too late that we've sort of missed the most important things in our life because we're so caught up in this what she calls the leaning in phenomenon. We have to remember, one, that you're going to die. Two, that you are made for connection. It doesn't matter if you're an introvert or an extrovert or whatever in the middle. If you are a human being, you need connection and you need deep connection, not shallow ones where you're simply talking about the weather or what the sports team did on a weekend. You need something that goes deeper than that. It doesn't mean the weather and sports aren't important. It just means that you have to go beneath it. I think sports, people who support a particular sports team and play a particular sport, is a good example of finding community. Because now there's a shared tradition, there's a shared value, shared system, shared knowledge, and that helps build deeper communities. And in our day and age, most people are not religious. And this means that there is certainly a need for something to act as what religion has acted as for hundreds and hundreds of years. And so if you're unable to replace religion, if you're unable to find community where previously you or your ancestors would have found community within religious traditions, you certainly need to find it somewhere else. And you certainly should make that a priority. It is very easy if you live in cities and you're working a nine to five to Simply do the 9 to 5, Monday to Friday, go home at 5, cook your supper, lounge on your couch, watch a movie, go to bed, do that over and over again until your vacation. And then when you go on vacation, you might go with your friends for two weeks and you have grand old time for two weeks. But then for the rest of the year, you do this over and over again. You repeat that for 30, 40 years. What you're going to have is a life filled with loneliness, a life filled with anxiety as Henley soon figured out, even though she had the social part down, right? She was going out all the time with friends, with coworkers, with politicians, with celebrities. And so for the rest of this podcast, it's going to be the episode with Sebastian Junger that I've done previously. So if you haven't listened to it, this episode is for you. First, agriculture and then industry changed two fundamental things about the human experience. The accumulation of personal property allowed people to make more and more individualistic choices about their lives, and those choices unavoidably diminished group effort towards a common good. And as society modernized, people found themselves able to live independently from any communal group. A person living in a modern city or a suburb can for the first time in history, go through an entire day or an entire life, mostly encountering complete strangers. They can be surrounded by others and yet feel deeply, dangerously alone. The evidence that this is hard on us is overwhelming. Although happiness is notoriously subjective and difficult to measure, mental illness is not. Numerous cross-cultural studies have shown that modern society, despite its nearly miraculous advances in medicine, science, and technology, is afflicted with some of the highest rates of depression, schizophrenia, poor health, anxiety, and chronic loneliness in human history. As affluence and urbanization rise in a society, 
rates of depression and suicide tends to go up rather than down. Rather than buffering people from clinical depression, increased wealth in a society seems to foster it. Suicide is difficult to study among unacculturated tribal people because the early explorers who first encountered them rarely conducted rigorous ethnographic research. That said, there is remarkably little evidence of depressions-based suicide in tribal societies. Among the American Indians, for example, suicide was understood to apply in a very narrow circumstance, in old age of avoiding burning the tribe, in the ritual of paroxysmus, of grief following the death of a spouse, in a hopeless but heroic battle with an enemy, and in an attempt to avoid the agony of torture. Among tribes that were ravaged by smallpox, it was also understood that a person whose face had been hideously disfigured by lesions might kill himself. According to the ethics of suicide historical sources, early chroniclers of the American Indians couldn't find any other example of suicide that were rooted in psychological causes. Early sources reported that the Bella Kula, the Ojibwe, the Montanegas, the Arapaho, the Plateau Yuma, the Sardin Paitu, the Zuni, among many others, experienced no suicide at all. This stands in stark contrast to many modern societies where the suicide rate is as high as 25 per 100,000 people. In the United States, white middle-aged men currently have the highest rates of nearly 30 suicides per 100,000. According to a global survey by the World Health Organization, people in wealthy countries suffer depression at as much as eight times the rate that they do in poor countries. And people in countries with large income disparities, like the United States, run a much higher lifelong risk of developing severe mood disorders. A 2006 study comparing depression rates in Nigeria to depression rates in North America found that across the board, women in rural areas were less likely to get depressed than their urban counterparts. And urban North American women, the most affluent demographic of the study, were the most likely to experience depression. The mechanism seems simple. Poor people are forced to share their time and resources more than wealthy people are, and as a result, they live in closer communities. Inter-reliant poverty comes with its own stresses, and certainly isn't the American ideal, but it's much closer to our evolutionary heritage than affluence. A wealthy person who has never had to rely on help and resources from his community is leading a privileged life that falls way outside more than a million years of human experience. Financial independence can lead to isolation, and isolation can put people at a greatly increased risk of depression and suicide. This might be a fair trade for a generally wealthier society, but a trade it is. This is an excerpt from Tribe on Homecoming and Belonging by Sebastian Junger. I first came across this book back in 2018 when a friend gave this to me. So shout out to Chris. Tribe makes a compelling case for why humans are built for community and why community is essential to living a happy and fulfilling life. Our modern society places us in a very, very different environment than that of our ancestors. For the first time in history, we can have whatever we want at the tip of our finger. We can get any type of cuisine if we want. We can get any type of clothes that we want. We can get anything as fast as the Amazon truck can get to us. But this sort of affluence creates a deep hole in the human soul such that it's almost impossible for it to be filled with any sort of material goods. And you and I know this. You and I know this because we read these books. In these books, we find that one of the most common practical advice that's given is to live a more simple life. Because the more simple your life is, the less you have to worry about and the less you have to lose because the more you have to lose, the more fragile you are. And Jünger's book, Tribe, it's not a big book at all. You could read this in a weekend. And he writes in such a manner, the stories that he tells makes you think about the life that you're living and whether the life that you're living is the life that you actually want to live, right? And whether you're missing something in this life. Human beings are made for community. We are social animals, which means that for us to thrive, we have to be in constant community with another, whether that is 
our church community, whether that's your friend community, whether that's your martial arts academy, whether that's your entrepreneur group that you have, you need community because in community, you've actually become more human. You see, even in prison, one of the worst prison sentences besides the death penalty is total isolation. We know that isolating human beings from the group is one of the worst things that you can do to the human being. And we do this to prisoners. But if we do this to prisoners, why do we do it to ourselves when we have the freedom to not be in isolation? Oftentimes it's because there is a sense of fear that's hidden. There's a sense of protecting yourself from dangers of not wanting to get hurt. But it's important that if you're in this situation that you actually pull yourself out and go and mingle with people to create your own tribe. So very early in the book, he brings up the comparison between American Indians and the settlers, the colonial settlers. Now, one point to note here is he uses the term American Indians because Gregory Gomez, whose story we're going to talk about later on, he's an Apache Indian, and he says that anybody born in the United States is a Native American, but not everybody is an American Indian. And so Gregory Gomez, the Apache, prefers the term American Indian. And so I'm going to use it the way Jünger uses American Indians here. It'll be interchangeable for me with Native Americans. So he compares the American Indians to the settlers. And what was happening early on, even as early as the 1612, was that settlers in Virginia, right, who were born in England, grew up in England, even just having spent a few years in this new land, either ended up joining an Indian tribe or started acting like them, hunting like them, dressing like them. There was a sense, there was something that was drawing these people to join these American Indian tribes. And so Jünger says... They, as in the settlers, the settlers emulated Indians, married them, were adopted by them, and on occasion even fought alongside them. And the opposite never happened. Indians almost never ran away to join white societies. Immigration always seemed to go from the civilized to the tribal, and it left Western thinkers flummoxed about how to explain such an apparent rejection of their society. And the reason for the shock is the white society, which here just means the European society, were considered the most civilized society of our time. And so why would a civilized man or a woman join the savages as they were referred to, join their tribe? And why did they have such a hard time reintegrating back to white societies when they were rescued? And why was it the case that these American Indians, they would never leave their tribe and join these white societies? And part of the reason why the American Indians never joined is because there's a very strong sense of loyalty built into the structure of the society. Cowardice and abandonment of tribe was one of those things that you were punished by death, as with murder, any kind of communication with the enemy, and the white settlers were considered the enemy, so obviously there was not going to be any of the joining. Even in situations where an American Indian child uh, was taken from the tribe at a very young age, raised in this European civilized world. If this child had the opportunity to come in contact with his or her native tribe, it became very hard for this child to come back to the civilized society. Even Benjamin Franklin was confused by this and pointed out that there were numerous settlers who were captured as adults and still seemed to prefer Indian societies to their own. So one of the stories that Jünger mentions is that of Henri Bouquet. Henri Bouquet is a Swiss general. He joins the fight against the American Indians. Essentially, he takes a few hundred soldiers and takes them into the heart of the Indian territory and takes that over and demands that the Indians return all the captured prisoners. So Jünger says, first and foremost, Bouquet demanded the immediate return of all white prisoners and any delay would be considered a declaration of war. During the next few weeks, around 200 captives were brought in, more than half of them women and children, and many too young to remember having lived otherwise. Some had forgotten their Christian names and were recorded in the ledgers with descriptions such as Red Jacket, Big Head, Sore Mouth, Sour Plums. Dozens of white relatives of the missing had accompanied Bouquet's forces from Fort Pitt, and in addition to the many joyful reunions, there were also wrenching scenes of grief and confusion. Young women married to Indian men, now standing reluctantly before their former families, children screaming as they were pulled from their Indian kin and delivered to people they didn't recognize and probably considered enemies. The Indians seemed universally anguished to give up their family members, and when Bouquet's army finally decamped from Fort Pitt in early November, many trailed behind the column hunting game for their loved ones and trying to delay the final goodbyes as long as possible. So what you're seeing here is this 
this strong sense of tie to this tribe. And the surprising thing is you're seeing this not only in children, which would make sense because children would have grown up only knowing one particular culture, which is the American Indian, but you're seeing this across the ages, right? Across prisoners, across males and females as well. And part of it is the intensely communal nature of the Indian tribe, which in contrast to the hugely successful Western civilization where there was abundance of material possessions, the intense ties that were created when they were in these communities couldn't compete with these white societies, these early settler communities. And so Junger says, as early as 1612, Spanish authorities noted in amazement that 40 or 50 Virginians had married into Indian tribes and that English women were openly mingling with the natives. At that point, whites had been in Virginia only a few years and many who joined the Indians would have been born and raised in England. These were not rough frontiersmen who were sneaking off to join the savages. These were sons and daughters of Europe. And so there's a story of this woman, Mary Jameson, who's captured by the Seneca tribe. And she writes in a letter why she thinks the Indian community is better than the white community. Again, her story is not unique. It was so common that the colonies started imposing penalties on anybody who left the colonies to join you know, their enemies, the American Indians. So Mary Jameson writes, Notwithstanding, the Indian women have all the fuel and bread to procure and the cooking to perform. Their task is probably not harder than that of white women. We had no master to oversee or drive us so that we could work as leisurely as we pleased. No people can live more happy than the Indians did in times of peace. And continuing with this example, there's a woman who's complaining to her sister about her husband who's essentially importing all the ways of the Indian and she's getting annoyed by this. So she writes, the men and the dogs have a fine time, but the poor women have to suffer. And the reason that she's suffering is because her husband, George, refuses to make their newborn son a plank cradle. What George does instead is he essentially just carves out, he, he hollows out a log instead of a cradle and then makes a wooden pillow for his son. And when this woman complains that, you know, this is giving child sores and blisters, George tells her that this hardship will toughen him up for the hunting that's going to happen later in life. So it's as if these early settlers, when they are actually in contact, when they're given the freedom to choose between their society, the Western white colonial society, and the American Indian society, they, without hesitation, join the other side. And so this tells us a few things. And it tells us that this communal way of living is more natural to human beings than this urban lifestyle that we live, where we don't even know who our neighbor is, whether that's right next to us or down the street from us. We don't know the people that we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis when we're commuting. We hardly know our own co-workers. And now we're getting to a point where we hardly know our own family because we've moved away from it. We live in a liberal society. And this society promises many, many things. It promises us freedom, promises us wealth, promises us the pursuit of happiness. The problem is the structure in which we get these things we have to abandon our tribe. You get removed from this tribe and transplanted into a completely different place where you don't know anybody, where you don't have any sort of relation with anyone. And then in this nakedness, you are supposed to find happiness. And what ends up happening is we deceive ourselves into believing that happiness will be derived through the accumulation of material possessions and wealth. Because this accumulation game that we play ultimately damages our soul, which we know, you know, we know this from Tolstoy 002. He has all the possessions in the world. He is one of the most successful novelists in history before the age of 50. He has a 16,200 acre estate and he's still not happy, right? What Tolstoy was able to achieve is the carrot for modern society that we too can be like Tolstoy and achieve all these things. Perhaps not the 16,200 acres of land, but we can achieve the status, the fame, and the wealth. But this is all a lie. And tribe here points this out. So in the beginning, we see this happening, right? Right in the beginning, we see that the American Indian tribes seem to be the most free. And the women say this because we see reports of this from captured white who are refusing to leave the Indian tribes. And to tie back to Mary Jameson, the woman who captured by one of the tribes, she observes that there's a sort of egalitarianism present in these smaller Indian communities. So Junger writes, Personal property was usually limited to whatever could be transported by horse or on foot, so gross inequalities of wealth were difficult to accumulate. 
Successful hunters and warriors could support multiple wives, but unlike modern society, those advantages were generally not passed on through the generations. Social status came through hunting and war, which all men had access to, and women had far more autonomy and sexual freedom and bore fewer children than women in white societies. One thing to remember while we're going through this book is to realize that tribal living is only possible within small groups of people, whether that's in villages, whether that's in hamlets. But as as more and more people join the tribe, the more and more difficult it is to live a tribal life. So Nassim Taleb, in Skid in the Game, which is the episode we just did before, 003, he has this quote in the book where he says, I am, at the Fed level, libertarian, at the state level, republican, at the local level, democrat, at the family and friends level, socialist. And the point here is there is scale at play. And that is why in in urban liberal societies, trying to create tribal way of life as a city is impossible. But it is possible on a much, much smaller level, right? It has to be smaller than municipal. It's all, almost like it has to be neighborly. Like you have to have neighbors that want to participate in this way of living. The tribal way of living is very close to the socialist way of living because you share everything, you do everything together. When somebody's sick, everybody helps in. When you need more food, the tribe helps you. Whereas as this scales, it becomes impossible to do. When I read this, I made a note here because I belong to a tribe called the Tankul Nagas, and these are native tribes in India. And for the Tankul Nagas specifically, after the missionary William Pettigrew came in 1899, the tribe, once it converted to Christianity, the unity for the tribe was formed around our shared belief in Christianity. Before it was outlawed, we were headhunting tribes. And one of the ways you acquired and accumulated status and wealth was through the collection of heads that you, that you lobbed off during a, during a battle. And there are lots of similarities between how the American Indians lived and how my ancestors, not very far back, two, three generations back, how they lived. And still in the villages, there's still a sense of closeness, of close, intense ties between families, between your neighbor, which I haven't found anywhere else outside of these villages. But it is important to note, as Jünger reminds us, it's easy for people in modern society to romanticize Indian life, and it might well have been easy for men like George as well. That impulse should be guarded against. Virtually all of the Indian tribes wage war against their neighbors and practice deeply sickening forms of torture. And some of these tortures would be if you weren't killed by a tomahawk, you were disemboweled and you were hung up by your intestines on a tree. So this is, you know, oftentimes it is easy to romanticize this sort of tribal living, but tribal living is very difficult. We're going to touch on this point specifically, the difficulty, because it is in the difficulty, it is in the struggle that people find that they are most happy because they are sharing the struggle with another and in sharing, they're able to carry each other's burden. So one thing that's very obvious when comparing the American Indian life and that of Western society is the stark difference in the level of material possessions, the level of material comfort, and the protection from hardship of the natural world. So Jünger writes, The question for modern society isn't so much why tribal life might be so appealing. It seems obvious on the face of it, but why Western society is so unappealing. On a material level, it is clearly more comfortable and protected from the hardships of the natural world. But as societies become more affluent, they tend to require more rather than less time and commitment by the individual. And it's possible that many people feel that affluence and safety simply aren't a good trade for freedom. And I think that captures why whites were fleeing their own colonies and joining American Indian tribes and why those who were captured by the American Indians refused to go back to their tribes. And you're going to tell stories of how some of them, when they were you know, rescued from these American Indian tribes and taken back to the colonies, they would find ways to escape the colonies to go back uh, to those that captured them in the beginning. I made a note here because it reminded me of something that Nassim Taleb said in Skin in the Game, which is 003. If you haven't listened to it, go listen to it. I'm almost certain I didn't actually mention this quote, but Taleb has a quote where he says, you want maximal free time, not maximal activity and you can assess your own success according to such metrics. For us in this liberal society that we live in, 
the status signaling thing is, oh, we're extremely busy. When you're trying to meet up with friends, they'll say, oh, I'm busy for the next month, two months. I can't meet at all. And that's a signal that's become so common because of the corporate enslavement that most people are stuck in. Whereas for Taleb, you want a free calendar. You want your calendar to be so free that you're busy because you are the one dictating what you want to do with your time. And this is precisely what the natives were doing. They had maximal free time. Their days were not filled up with useless BS activities of doing meetings, of doing project brainstorming. They didn't have any of these things. They went together, they hunted, they brought their food back, they cooked the food together. Then if they needed more food, then they would go hunt again. But otherwise, you lived a life where you dictated what you did with your own time. And Jünger brings up a tribe from the Kalahari Desert. At first, when I saw this tribe, when I was reading this, I couldn't pronounce this because it's spelt in a very strange way. It's spelt with exclamation mark, K-U-N-G, right? It looks like you pronounce it Kung, but I wanted to figure out how to actually pronounce it. So so I went down and I found a whole Reddit thread on people discussing how to dis- how to pronounce this word. Um, and I found an eight minute audio of a native person from this tribe pronouncing different words and he pronounced how to actually pronounce this tribe. So now I'm going to read the quote with this name inside. The relatively relaxed pace of the life, even during times of adversity, challenged long-standing ideas that modern society created a surplus of leisure time. It created exactly the opposite, a desperate cycle of work, financial obligation, and more work. The had far fewer belongings than Westerners, but their lives were under much greater personal control. The point here is that you, you see the sort of freedom across not only tribes in Africa, but tribes in America, tribes in parts of Asia, like my own tribe, the Tanko Nagas. And it's a sense of personal control of what they do with their time. When you're able to do this, that is when you have the most freedom. And when you have this, that's also when you are most happy. But when your time is dictated by somebody else, by a manager who tells you what to do, when to do it, oftentimes people feel like they don't have control. And this leads to a spiral where because they don't feel like they have the control, that they become sad and the sadness can lead to depression and the cycle spins out of control. So one of the things you and I have to make sure is that we have, we control what we do with our time. And controlling what you do with your time could mean many different things, right? For those of us who work a nine to five, who enjoy what we do during the nine to five, but is not our most favorite activity, it's important that from five until 10, you do what you love the most, right? You do what gives you energy, and then in the morning from six to nine, you do the same thing. And having that, those sort of activities where you control what you do when you do it, that makes a huge difference. The mistake that people make is they go from nine to five and they feel completely exhausted. And because they feel completely exhausted, they let the five to 10, 11 p.m. go wasted. Wasted on mindlessly scrolling through Instagram, TikTok, whatever else. But when you actually take control of your time, that will make a huge difference. And I recommend doing that. The unscheduled life can be a detriment to many. Because as a species, this modern world that we're living is completely new. We don't suffer hunger for the most part. If you're listening to this podcast, you have access to the internet, to a world of knowledge that most of human civilization never had. You have the Library of Alexandria. So if you're listening to this podcast, you have more than most of human society. We don't suffer much violence either. We don't suffer much hardship either in the Western world. We live in large cities with access to all sorts of cuisines, all sorts of activities, all sorts of material goods. We also do everything for ourselves, meaning for the individual. And once we left our family, our tribe, and our villages and moved to cities, we mainly started focusing on ourselves, on on focusing on our careers, on becoming more wealthy, becoming more famous. These things that we do only benefit us. And in so doing, we became more selfish. And we see this clearest when we decide to have children and put our children in daycare because daycare, the concept of daycare is very strange to me. It's strange to me because having grown up, we never had daycare. We grew up amongst family. We grew up amongst our aunts, our cousins, our grandparents. But here in the West, because we're so inwardly focused, we have, and because we're so focused on our careers, we don't have time for our children. So then we take our children and put them in the hands, in the care of random strangers for eight hours of the day, only to realize that now they're going to school and then now they're going to college and now they're getting married. 
and we realize a bit too late. So then we try to save ourselves by spending time with our grandchildren. The saddest part is what likely will happen to most people in the West here. Once you get to a point where you can no longer function by yourself, even though independence is something that we've all been pushing for, you, you get to a point as an elderly person where you cannot live by yourself. Your children will likely put you in or you will put yourself in an old age home. The last stretch of your life is spent by yourself alone and not with family. This is one of the worst things. And this is sad because it's only in the West that we have this nonchalant attitude towards the old people who paved the way for us. Whereas in any other culture, the older people, the elderly are the ones with the most respect. And so you never abandon, you would never see people put their parents in old age homes unless they've been fully westernized. Otherwise, the grandparents are brought into the home and given the opportunity to form a bond with their grandkids because these grandkids only exist because of these grandparents. And so there's a circle of life that we've lost in the West because of how individualistic we've become here. Right? We live in these large cities with very little sense of community. You can be walking down the street in a huge crowd and feel the loneliest. This is all part of the design of a liberal society. The accumulation of personal property allowed people to make more and more individualistic choices about their lives. And those choices unavoidably diminished group efforts towards a common good. And this idea of the common good is what we have, in a sense, lost. Because when you have a common good within a tribe, it allows a tribe to function as a cohesive unit. But when you're in a large city where you don't know anybody besides a handful of friends, say three, four friends that you met somewhere, it's very difficult to have a shared goal for the community. So it's, it is important, especially in our modern society, that you and I find people who are similar to us, who we can connect with on a much deeper fundamental level than your trivial, let's talk about movies, where you can go much deeper, you can talk about your struggles, where you can communicate, where you can get to a point, you know that the other person will have your back when you need it, and they won't abandon you in your worst times. And you and I have both experienced friends that we thought would be friends for life, and then when our darkest moments came, they abandoned us. They abandoned you, and you felt betrayed, and betrayed because you thought that they would be there for you. And you have been there for them. And in these situations, it is important for us to forgive those friends because sometimes they abandon you, not because they intentionally wanted to run away, but because they didn't know what to do. They ran away because they couldn't face the pain of seeing you in pain. And part of the reason why this happens is it's because we're all individuals in this unconnected world. Whereas historically, human beings have had some form of community and very strong communities and, and has often come through, through religion, once we went from tribal living to larger communal living, say a town to a city, then you had religion to act the same way that tribes acted. Because within the religion, you have a shared belief. You have a shared system of belief and practices. And so if one struggles and one is suffering in this community, the whole group can get together, even if the individuals in the group are not themselves strong enough to support the other person, the group together can act as a, as a unit to support the need of this one person. So if you are religious, you are already one step ahead of most other people because the religious affiliation is continuously dropping in the United States and it keeps getting lower and lower each year. What this means is that as a society, we're getting lonelier and loneliness is one of the worst things that human beings can suffer. There's an important distinction between loneliness and solitude. Loneliness is when you feel like you don't have any deep connection with anybody. Solitude is what you seek for, even if you have deep connections with people. Solitude is the intentional time that you spend with yourself in silence, in reflecting on your life, in reflecting on the wisdom literature that you and I are reading. It is extremely important and crucial that we practice some form of solitude in our lives. And it's never too late to start. It doesn't matter how old you are. Solitude is something that you should do, whether that's early in the morning before anybody else in your family is awake, or it's late at night when everybody's asleep. You have to make sure that you spend some time by yourself thinking and reflecting upon your day, upon your life, and whether the actions that you have 
done today, the thoughts that you've had, align with who you want to be and who you know you should be. And solitude is something that the greatest sages in human history have always practiced, whether that's Jesus, whether that's a Buddha, whether that's Lao Tzu, Confucius, they all practice solitude. It is only in solitude that you find the deepest connection, and that is the connection with the source of life. It is only in solitude that you realize the profoundness of this life. And Viktor Frankl, in Man's Search for Meaning, and I talked about this in 001, the prisoners in the concentration camps all sought after solitude. But the difference was that, but for them, they had to make sure that the guards didn't see them spending too much time by themselves because then the guards might mistake them for trying to escape. So Viktor Frankl at one point is sitting beside a bunch of dead bodies and he's just sitting there because that's the only place that he can find solitude. And in his solitude is where he begins to imagine his life after the concentration camp, even though he has no ability of knowing that he's going to be saved. But it is in the solitude that he visualizes the future and really feels it. And so for you and I, we have to make sure that we implement solitude in our life, the practice of solitude in our life. And it is also important to realize that there is a big difference between solitude and loneliness. And loneliness is going to be a huge market that's going to be exploited by the tech industry in the next few years. You're going to see a rise in AI girlfriends, AI boyfriends, and probably AI parents who can act as parents to you because many people have felt that they've been abandoned by their parents. As the society gets lonelier, all your suffering starts to turn inwards. And because you have not found a way to express this and have not found a way to unburden your struggling, as the individuals in the society gets lonelier and lonelier, we will get to a point where any sort of loose affiliation will capture these people simply because they want to belong, right? And this is why there are brands that are starting to get cult followings precisely because the people who are following these brands are looking for a deep connection and wherever they find it, they will join that group whether that's religion, whether that's a brand, whether that's some sort of leader, they want to feel connected. And as mentioned, the rise of loneliness, I think, is, is closely tied to affluence. The more affluent a society gets, the lonelier it becomes because we know that rates of depression and suicide go up the more affluent and more urbanized a society is. You would think that increased wealth in a society would have the opposite effect because we are sort of brought up into believing that affluence is what gives you happiness. But obviously, you and I both know that this is not the case. And again, we have the example of Tolstoy. If you haven't listened to it, listen to it, it's 002, where he has everything, but he's lonely. He doesn't feel like he belongs to the group that he belongs to, which is the aristocratic group, because they're not living the way that they should be living, that they don't have the values that he has. Junger says, the more assimilated a person is into American society, the more likely they are to develop depression during the course of their lifetime, regardless of ethnicities. And he gives the example of Mexicans who are born in the U.S. They tend to be wealthier than Mexicans born in Mexico. But the Mexicans born in U the U.S. are far more likely to suffer depression. So the question is, what is it that makes us happier? What is it that brings us the sort of deep sense of belonging? And it's three things. It's very similar to Viktor Frankl's logotherapy. Viktor Frankl is episode 001. And this, and I quote Junger, Human beings have three basic things in order to be content. One, they need to feel competent in what they do. Two, they need to feel authentic in their lives. And three, they need to feel connected to others. These values are considered intrinsic to human happiness and far outweigh extrinsic values such as beauty, money, and status. And it's these three things that drew the early settlers to the American Indian community more than their own community. Right. And even though our cities are teeming with people, we are in a very real sense very similar to the settlers in that we don't have a sense of belonging to a very strong community. And just as the settlers were escaping to join the American Indians, we too are trying to find ways to join some sort of tribe, whether that's internet groups or somewhere else. This speaks to something very powerful in that we human beings are social animals and require a very strong community to belong to. And if we don't have this belonging, it is going to affect us and impact us in a negative manner. I'm quoting from Tribe here. Infants in hunter-gatherer societies are carried by their mothers as much as 90% of the time, which roughly corresponds to carrying rates among other primates. 
one can get an idea of how important this kind of touch is to primates from an infamous experiment conducted in 1950 by a primatologist and psychologist named Harry Harlow. Baby rhesus monkeys were separated from their mothers and presented with the choice of two kinds of surrogates, a cuddly mother made out of terry cloth or an uninviting mother made out of wire mesh. The wire mesh mother, however, had a nipple that dispensed warm milk. The babies took their nourishment as quickly as possible and then rushed back to cling to the terry cloth mother, which had enough softness to provide the illusion of affection. Clearly, touch and closeness are vital to the health of the baby primates, including humans. In America, during the 1970s, mothers maintained skin-to-skin -skin contact with babies as little as 16% of the time, which is a level that traditional societies would probably consider a form of child abuse. Also unthinkable would be the modern practice of making young children sleep by themselves. In two American studies of middle-class families during the 1980s, 85% of young children slept alone in their own room a figure that rose to 95% among families considered well-educated. Northern European societies, including America, are the only ones in history to make very young children sleep alone in such numbers. Isolation is thought to make many children bond intensely with stuffed animals for reassurance. Only in Northern European societies do children go from the well-known developmental stage of bonding with stuffed animals. Elsewhere, children get their sense of safety from the adults sleeping near them. The point of making children sleep alone, according to the Western psychologist, is to make themselves soothing. But that clearly runs contrary to our evolution. Humans are primates. We share 98% of our DNA with chimpanzees and the primates almost and primates almost never leave infants unattended because they would be extremely vulnerable to predators. Infants seem to know this instinctively. So being left alone in a dark room is terrifying to them. This section stood out to me because I have a baby and we co-sleep with our baby. And this is the way that I was brought up and this is what I found normal. And what I found abnormal is precisely this, that in North America, people put their child in a totally separate room and children as young as six months are taught, in quotes, to learn to sleep by themselves in the dark. There are grown adults who are afraid of the dark and you expect children with no sense of the world who are still trying to figure out what the world is to be okay in sleeping in the dark through self-soothing means. But the point is that this sort of practice within Northern European society seems to have an impact on adults as they get older and older. It seems to increase the likeliness of PTSD in adults. And again, built into our society is this idea that you must be separated from the one person you need the most, which is the mother. So as young as six months, you are separated. And so the child ends up bonding with stuffed animals. Whereas in traditional societies like the American Indians, Tonkal Nagas um. tribe in the Kalahari Desert, this is not the case. And so there's a much stronger bonding that happens, a much stronger sense of belonging that happens. And there's less likelihood that these people in these communities suffer depression. Within the liberal society, the gospel is independence. To find independence from your family, to find independence from your village, to find independence from your tribe. And we've integrated this so deeply into the way we live in liberal societies that we've pushed this onto our very young children. We want them to be independent as young as possible by making them sleep by themselves, to self-soothe, to do all these things that are completely unnatural to our evolutionary past. And you look at any other mammals, if you've owned dogs, if you've owned cats, and when the mother gives birth to their litter, the mother never leaves the kittens or the puppies alone. If the puppies cry out or the kittens cry out, the mother is there. And the, these kittens and puppies will sleep by the mother's side almost always. But the crazy thing is these things, these animals develop much faster than humans. Within a period of a few weeks, these puppies and kittens have grown to be quite independent. However, they will stick by the mother's side for as long as they need. And eventually they've learned to find independence. I just had some pigeons on my balcony. This mother laid an egg and the, the egg hatched. The mother pigeon stayed by this pigeon site until the pigeon knew how to fly. And it would always return to feed the pigeon. She only left to find food for her baby and then would come back to feed it. The mother pigeon slept with the baby pigeon for weeks on end until the baby pigeon could fly on its own. Whereas us humans in the West, so stuck in our way of seeking independence in this society that we want our children who are not even a year old who 
who can't even express how they feel in words. We want them to sleep by themselves. And when they cry because they are fearful of the dark, because they feel like they've been abandoned by their mother, we say, oh, they're self-soothing. They'll cry themselves to sleep. This is one of these Western ideas that I cannot get behind because it is completely unnatural to the way human beings have evolved. The point here is that it is so embedded in the way that we live in the West that we must be independent from our family, our tribe, our village, that it ends up har harming the individual. And the individual in seeking for some sort of connection with others will now start to look for this connection on the internet. And they start banning behind political ideas that, that seem to have very strong ties. So then they, they are drawn to this instead of you know, finding their connection back to their root, which, is, which would be their family. Instead of doing that, they're looking for connections among strangers because they know that these strangers are also looking for connection and they're also likely living in urban places. And it's actually quite difficult to recreate the sense of communal living, this tribal traditional way of living in our urban societies, just because there's class divisions right, between the wealthy and the poor. But there are moments in human history, in modern human history, where that has not happened. There's been a sporadic rise in communal, tribal, traditional living. The examples that Jung provides, there are three examples that he provides. One is the Avezzano, Italy in 1915, when there's an earthquake. Then World War II in London, when the uh, Germans did their blitzkrieg for 57 consecutive days. And then there is the earthquake that happened in Chile. So I'm going to go in order first with the Avezzano, Italy in 1915. So there's an earthquake in, in Italy, in Avezzano specifically, that kills 30,000 people in less than a minute. And immediately when this happens, people band together to rescue all the injured. And unfortunately, the, the tragedy of the earthquake created a sense of community because the earthquake didn't care whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you are of this one ethnic group, whether you are of that different ethnic group, it didn't matter. And for the first time for many years, it allowed people to essentially live live close to the way of the tribal societies, living to survive from the day to day. This created an egalitarian society. Even though they lost many, many things, people had a sense of belonging because they felt that other people were helping them. The other example that he gives, the second example is in World War II, London, suffers the blitzkrieg for 57 days, direct bombing that happens from the German. And the bureaucrats, English government bureaucrats, had projected that, that would be, there would be a serious increase in mass hysteria because of these bombings. However, nothing could be further from the truth. What ended up happening is during these 57 days and uh, weeks after, the psychiatrists were puzzled because long-standing patients saw their sim symptoms subside during the period of the intense air raids. Voluntary admissions to psychiatric wards declined. Even epileptics reported having fewer seizures. And part of that was, again, the bombing leveled the playing field, both literally and figuratively. There was no longer a class division. People were living day to day to help each other out, making sure that, you know, Sally from the next door neighbor had enough food to feed her kids. Jim from the opposite side of the street had a bed to sleep on at night. There's even organic laws that popped up on how to treat each other, what to do when this happens, what to do when that happens. Crime rates dropped. And it was an incredible thing because it seemed to be that, that there was some positive effect of war on the mental health of the people. This positive effect that was happening on people's mental health because of war. And this was first noticed by the sociologist Emile Durkheim. So Emile Durkheim found that when European countries went to war, suicide rate drops. Psychiatric wards in Paris became empty between both World War I and World War II. Less and less voluntary admissions to psychiatric wards. And this was true even of the Germans. And I quote Jünger here. An Irish psychologist named H.A. Leons found that suicide rates in Belfast dropped 50% during the riots of 1969 and 1970s, and homicides and other violent crimes also went down. Depression rates for both men and women declined abruptly during period, with men experiencing the most extreme drop in the most violent districts. County Derry, on the other hand, which suffered almost no violence at all, saw male depression rates rise rather than fall 
Leon's hypothesized that men in peaceful areas were depressed because they couldn't help their society by participating in the struggle. This is similar to the three ways in which people find happiness that we talked about earlier. And, and it's this idea that people need to feel competent and feel connected. And the males in County Derby didn't feel like they were connected because they didn't feel like they were helping their society. So the other example it gives is Chile. There's an earthquake, killed 70,000 people. It's had the same effect. It leveled the status. There was a sense of brotherhood that grows out of this. And people are helping each other. It didn't matter what class they were in, whether they were lower or upper class. It was a collaborative effort to help people. But then the, the interesting thing happens when help comes, when the choppers start coming and dropping aid, the class divide returns. What these examples are telling us is that human beings, humans need struggle, right? To feel a sense of belonging and not in a sadistic manner, but that sense where you feel like you're competent in what you do, that you're connected to others and that you're actually helping others, right? All three of those things are fulfilled when there is crisis that happens in the society, right? That's when people band together. There's a term that's used in tribe called the brotherhood of pain, whereas in modern society, the sort of social bond that happens in times of crisis, in times of struggle is basically gone. It doesn't exist, right? Because we don't have struggle. We don't face too much hardship in our world. Pain and struggle are the great equalizers after death. Death is the great equalizer. So Jünger writes, the beauty and the tragedy of the modern world is that it eliminates many situations that require people to demonstrate commitment to the collective good protected by police and fire departments and relieved of most of the challenges of survival, an urban man might go through his entire life without having to come to the aid of someone in danger or even give up his dinner. And I continue, what would you risk dying for and for whom is perhaps the most profound question a person can ask themselves. The vast majority of people in modern society are not able to pass their whole lives without ever having to answer that question, which is both an enormous blessing and a significant loss. It is a loss because having to face that question has for tens of millennia been one of the ways that we have defined ourselves as people. This is a question that we must ask. Who would we die for? Would you die for your country? Would you die for your family? Would you die for your spouse? Would you die for your child? So there's a well-known story of Marianne Backmeyer, who is a mother from West Germany, and she kills Klaus, who is tried for raping and murdering Marianne's daughter, Anna. And so on this particular day, she walks up into the court, pulls out her Beretta 70, and she aims the gun at his back and shoots him seven times and kills him instantly. Marianne was willing to go to prison for her daughter, and she killed for her daughter. The sense of fighting for justice, the sense of fighting for something greater than yourself, something other than yourself is embedded in the human nature. Obviously, in this case with Marianne, it's a horrible situation to be in. But when you look at the tribes of American Indians, they are fighting the settlers who are taking their land slowly and slowly. And so they're having these battles, right? And, and as a result, the, the tribes band together to fight the white settlers. And in that creates a cohesive bond amongst each other. All of this the sense of community, the sense of belonging is extremely, extremely important for warriors, for soldiers. And in our society, we don't treat our soldiers, our veterans great at all. Many of these soldiers have experienced traumas that most modern humans would never experience, but they're treated very poorly. Yes, it's true that there are all these programs in place now to help soldiers reintegrate back into society, to help them with their PTSD. However, when you look at how the natives treated their warriors, it's very, very different from the way we treat our warriors. And Jünger says that perhaps one of the ways to evaluate the health of a society is to look at how quickly her soldiers recovered for combat. We don't really do a good job at helping soldiers reintegrate back into society. Part of the reason why soldiers have a difficult time recovering is because they experience some of the worst times and some of the best times at war, right? Their best times in that they feel the most bonded to their brothers, but some of the worst times because they see some of their brothers die. And that stays with you. And that's nothing. And that's, that's not an experience that many people have. So whereas the American Indians, almost all the tribes, had a way of helping their warriors integrate back into society because they believe that a warrior 
who does not integrate well into the society will become a harm to the society itself. And so they do all these cleansing and purification rituals and ceremonies, which can last for weeks on end, depending on which one you do. And what it's supposed to do is it's supposed to help the warrior integrate his dark side with the light for him to come to terms with what he has done, the violence that he has committed, he has seen. And this whole thing is done within a community, meaning that sometimes the community itself, the tribe itself would do the ceremony with the warriors. Gregory Gomez, Apache Indian who grew up in West Texas, and I mentioned him right in the beginning. He's the one who says to Junger to not use the term Native American and instead use American Indian. He fights in Vietnam and he's part of the Marine Force Recon. And he says he joined it not because he was serving his country, but he says he joined the Marine Forces not because he wanted to serve his country, but because he was a warrior. And so when Gomez returns, he goes through a purification ceremony, right? He does the ceremony known as the Sundance. And it's a traditional Latoka ceremony, which was banned by the U.S. until uh, 1934. And then, and then they allowed it to happen. But, but what ha- happens in the Sundance is that the ones who are uh, the initiators, their chest are pierced with uh, wooden skewers and leather strings are tied to these skewers. And then they are attached to a tall pole and they're hanging from this tall pole. I dance back and forth and throw my arms and yell and I could see the ropes and the piercing sticks like in slow motion flying from my chest towards the grandfather tree and I had this incredible feeling of euphoria and strength like I could do anything. That's when the healing takes place. That's when life changes takes place. What Gomez is going through in doing this ritual where he's facing the demons that he has had to encounter or, and in one sense, he's had to also channel in a totally different type of character, possibly in the face of death. Channeling of the alter ego is something that high-performing athletes do all the time. Kobe Bryant is known for having an alter ego, right? He was the Black Mamba. Beyonce has her other alter ego. Taylor Swift has her alter ego. And high-performing people do this because it allows them it allows them to mask their insecurities that they would have normally as, say, Kobe Bryant or as, say, as Tiger Woods or as Taylor Swift. But one of the main goals in our life is that there is no compartmentalization in our lives. You want to live such that by the end of your life, there is only one you, that there is no disparate versions of you where who you are with your family is different than who you are with your friends, than who you are on the field, on the court, that who you are in work, that who you are at work. And so what Gomez is doing here is he's integrating the Gomez that went to war in Vietnam and faced all these horrible things and did all these horrible things with the Gomez that he wants to be when he returns to society. And that's why this sort of initiation is important for us generally, because these sort of initiations, these sort of rituals, Uh, creates a space where people can face their fears, where people can come to terms with who they are and who they've been and integrate that into themselves so that they can live as a unified whole, that they can live in a harmonious manner. The sort of yin and yang that Taoist philosophy talks about, where the opposites live in harmony with each other. And when we look at virtues generally, virtues are the perfect balance between the two opposites, right? Courage, for example, is a virtue because courage is the center point, is the median between being brash and being being cowardly. You want to be in that middle, and it's a very fine balance, but that is the whole point of living, is to get to the point where we are not living in excess. Because living in excess is great for a short while, but it'll burn you out. But living in harmony, that is where beauty arises, that is where living begins. And this is another reason why this idea of being present in the moment aligns with so many people because being present in the moment means you're not thinking about tomorrow, which is the extreme end, and you're not thinking about the past, which is the other extreme end, neither of which you can be in. But being able to be here right now when you are spending time with your family, when you're spending time with your kids, when you're spending time with your friends, when you're spending time learning, being here right now, that is the practice that we're all working towards. And so for Gomez, when he's hanging here, the pain that he's going through, right? The pain that he's going through, he's allowing himself to really feel the pain, to really dive into the places that he has been fearful of going because he didn't know if he would be able to survive it. 
And in one sense, many religions have these form of rituals, these form of initiations. So within Christianity, there is the baptism that takes place. And baptism is not necessarily unique to Christianity. But baptism is a form where the old self dies for the new self to arise. And the new self is the integrated one. It is the one who's faced the demons. And for Gomez, his baptism is this sun dance. Gomez experiences an altered conscious state. And in this altered conscious state, he's able to face whatever demons he had been battling with. And on this point about altered conscious states, we do essentially in our modern day and age play with rituals, but we don't take rituals very seriously. You have psychedelic mushrooms. People take psychedelic mushrooms because they think it's fun. They think it's, you know, they find it entertaining to, you know, see geometric patterns, to feel like you're melting into the couch. And people do these things because they find it entertaining. However, psychedelic mushrooms create altered states of consciousness. And this altered state of consciousness historically has always been preserved within some form of initiation. And it's never taken out of this context. However, in the West, we've desecrated, totally ripped the veil. And in doing so, we've actually lost the power that is within these rituals. I read this book by Michael Pollan, How to Change Your Mind, years and years ago. And that book actually changed my mind on psychedelic mushrooms specifically, in that for a long time, I'd been following the research on psychedelic mushrooms and how powerful it is on helping people, specifically on helping soldiers who are returning from war with their PTSD. And I knew of this, but then when I read How to Change Your Mind, that was my turning point. And one of the things that stood out to me was that Paulin makes the point that psychedelics, at least within South America, always had some sort of shamanic practice around it because they wanted to keep it sacred. But it was the Westerners who came in and completely ripped it apart from the shamanic practice and made and democratized it. And in democratizing it, you lost the valuable insights that you can gain from entering into these states of altered consciousness. And obviously, the American Indians knew the power of entering these states of altered consciousness such that they made all their warriors enter this state, whether it was through the Sundance, whether it was through another ritualistic ceremony, they all had to go through this. And that's why I think it's very powerful. And, and if you're thinking about playing with psychedelic mushrooms, you should be very careful. Not careful because I think something might happen to you, but more so careful in that you should approach it with a sense of respect and reverence and making sure that you are fully prepared for what you are about to experience. You have to prepare your mind and your body for the consumption of these things. So make sure you do that because it can impart knowledge through the experience. A virtuous man is not somebody who has not faced any of the temptations, but is somebody who's faced a temptation and overcome the temptation. But to do that, you have to face it. You have to overcome these things. And similarly, there are darkness within all of us that you must face. And it is painful. It's always painful to face. But once you do it, as Gomez says, that's when life changes take place. This is why initiations and ceremonies, this, these type of ceremonies have always existed throughout human history. You have to have these sort of initiations, these ceremonies to help people process the things that they've gone through. The Greeks, the ancient Greeks, went to the Temple of Delphi to do their own form of initiation. And Gomez says it was when he went to war that he became an old man. And he became an old man because in war... Not only do you see horrible things, but you do horrible things in the act of saving yourself, in the act of saving your comrade. Another reason why it's hard for soldiers to integrate with the society is because they feel disconnected with the society at large when they return. Right? They, when they were at war, they had such a close bond with their brothers that they felt like a tribe. Right? And it's a sense of tribal, tri it's a sense of tribalistic bonding, the brotherhood of pain that creates such a strong tie between people that when they return to society and these brothers are separated, right? They go back to their families. They're longing for this connection. But in a liberal society, that connection is not there. Or if it is, it's very hard to come by. And so then their trauma becomes worse because nobody else can understand what they're going through. And the society as a whole has not suffered at all. And because our wars take place outside of our countries, there is 
very, very little sense in which we understand what's going on in the lives of these soldiers. Whereas the American Indians, they knew full well that if their warriors died and were defeated on the battlefield, then likely their their lives were going to be in danger. Whereas for us, so many soldiers have been killed in wars that are happening on foreign lands. And the people here don't think twice about it because they don't feel like their lives are in danger. And so for Gomez, he had to find a way to face these demons. And Junger writes, warriors had to be recognized and were charged with the responsibility to take care of others, to practice self-discipline and to provide leadership. The social contract was assumed now as Wichisha Yatapika, man they praise. The question to ask ourselves, you and I, is have we become a person who can responsibly take care of others? Do we practice self-discipline? And are we providing leadership? And these last two are crucial. Without the practice of self-discipline, it is very difficult to provide leadership and to care for others. Because if you are not honest with yourself, and if you don't have a good reputation with yourself, which self-discipline essentially is, you're creating a reputation with yourself, a good reputation with yourself. If you don't do that, you cannot be helpful to your society. You cannot be responsible for others. You have to. And the other thing is, we cannot live in comfort. Comfort kills the soul. It produces malice in the soul. Comfortability breeds laziness. Affluence is one of the biggest things that makes us weaker. But it affluence itself, there's nothing evil with being affluent either. What the important thing is, is the practice of making sure that we do the hard things, that we do the things that we say we'll do, that we practice what we preach, that we have skin in the game, that we, we take the risks of our beliefs, that you stand firm for what you believe in. And I've said this before now, practicing a form of sparring martial art, whether that's boxing, Muay Thai, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, wrestling, is one of the best ways to see in real life what having skin in the game is like. Practicing these sort of martial arts has a positive impact on you that goes beyond improving your confidence increases your reputation with yourself because you know what you are capable of. To know that you're capable of violence, but to have it controlled is a great sense of responsibility. And we must use that responsibility well. So if you're not practicing martial art, I highly recommend you go find a place to, to start training. And I'll wrap with that. If you've enjoyed this episode, share it with a friend, leave a comment below. If you're listening to